During the first 10 years of his existence, from 1967 to 1977, Genesis was one of the world's most famous and influential prog rock bands, creating classic albums like Nursery Crime, Foxtrot, Selling England by the Pound, and The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. In our first video about Genesis, we covered the band's celebrated early period. For most of the time, it featured the classic lineup of singer Peter Gabriel, guitarist Steve Hackett, keyboardist Tony Banks, bassist and guitarist Mike Rutherford, and drummer and vocalist Phil Collins. Gabriel left the band in 1975 to pursue a solo career, which we all know turned out to be extremely successful. Despite widespread doubts that the band could survive the departure of what many perceived as its leader, Collins took over as singer and frontman. The quartet came up with an excellent and commercially successful album, A Trick of the Tale. Steve Hackett went solo in 1977 after completing the touring for the last Genesis studio album he appeared on, Wind and Wuthering, in 1976. His last recorded appearance with the band was on the live double album Seconds Out. With Genesis reduced to Phil Collins, Tony Banks, and Mike Rutherford, there were, once again, big question marks over the trio's capacity and legitimacy to continue. However, Collins, Banks, and Rutherford came up with the successful album, and then there were three. Here's where we pick up the story in this video. We previously charted the development of Genesis from schoolboy beginnings to leaders of the prog rock genre, adored by a cult following of connoisseurs of great music. This video traces the story of how the band changed musical direction, went mainstream, and became one of the most commercially successful rock acts of all time, while still remaining true to its prog rock roots. Following Hackett's departure after the end of the Wind and Wuthering tour in July of 1977, Collins, Banks, and Rutherford literally and figuratively did not miss a beat. In August, the trio mixed Seconds Out at Trident Studios in London with producer David Henschel. At the same time, they were busy rehearsing material for a new album at Shepperton Studios, a film studio in Surrey. In September, the band and Henschel went to Relight Studios in Hilvarenbeek in the Netherlands to record the follow-up to Wind and Wuthering, which had been recorded in the same studio a year earlier. The band seemed completely undaunted by being reduced to a trio. Tony Banks stated in an interview, when people leave, it's quite exciting because the people they left have to broaden out. And the fewer people we have, the easier it is to work in the studio. And Mike Rutherford explained in a TV documentary in 1980, as we were when we started um, developing as sort of personalities, expanding as, as writers and musicians, need more room. And we could barely contain five. And now, uh, then we were four for a while, and they kind of developed, and you could barely contain that. And now there's three of us, and there's, there's a lot more room for each person to breathe and move in, which I think is actually a secret in a group where a lot, everyone writes. Rather than trying to find another guitar player, the band's bassist and rhythm guitarist, Mike Rutherford, broadened out into playing lead guitar as well. Furthermore, the group decided on a distinct change in musical direction, with shorter songs and more traditional song structures, and often a romantic feel. Collins remarked, we have never really, apart from perhaps this album, written love songs. We've always shunned away from them for some reason, a subconscious thing. It's getting to a point now when most of the songs can be taken as love songs. Snowbound, for instance, is very romantic. Producer David Henschel commented, there was a conscious decision to try and write more tracks that were radio friendly. If not three minutes long, then maybe four and a bit. They probably felt a pressure to get more airplay. The four-minute lead single for the album Follow You, Follow Me was a case in point. Starting with a guitar riff using an MXR flanger pedal, the song develops into a medium-tempo pop ballad that was unlike anything Genesis had done before, and was intended to attract more female fans. Follow You, Follow Me marked the band's first entry into the UK Top 10 and was its first big hit single in many other countries. The album And Then There Were Three was released in March of 1978. Helped by the success of the lead single, it became the band's most commercially successful album to date, reaching number three in the UK. 
However, reviews were mixed, with qualifications ranging from remarkably powerful to hip muzak. The latter was a reference to the album's romantic soft rock nature, with a rather woolly keyboard dominated production. Genesis started touring the album immediately after its release, again with Chester Thompson as second drummer, as well as the addition of American guitarist Daryl Sturmer. The tour finished in December, after which the band went on hiatus, allowing Collins to try and save his disintegrating marriage. Banks and Rutherford took the opportunity to work on their debut solo albums. In the spring and summer of 1979, Banks recorded A Curious Feeling at Polar Music Studios in Stockholm, Sweden together with drummer Chester Thompson and singer Kim Beacon. Rutherford recorded his solo album, Small Creeps Day, at the same studio. David Henschel again helped produce the record, which featured guest musicians like Anthony Phillips on keyboards, Simon Phillips on drums, and Noel McCalla on vocals. Neither album did particularly well. Collins' attempt to save his marriage failed, and with Genesis still on hiatus, he worked with jazz fusion band Brand X and appeared on its fourth album, Product. In addition, Collins took part in recording sessions for John Martin's Grace and Danger and Peter Gabriel's Peter Gabriel, in which he played the famous drum part on Intruder. While still at his home in Shelford, Surrey, Collins was also busy writing songs about his breakup in a private studio that he called Old Croft. He used a Roland CR78 Compu Rhythm drum machine, as well as a Fender Rhodes, Prophet 5, and Roland VP300 vocoder. Many of these songs would eventually find their way onto his debut solo album, Face Value, which includes the music-changing monster hit in the air tonight. By the fall of 1979, the three Genesis members reconvened at Collins Place and started work on a new album. Because they had all been writing solo material, they did not have as much Genesis material lying around as normal, and many of the songs were written together during rehearsals. Collins reportedly proposed In the Air Tonight, but it was rejected. However, the two other songs he presented, Misunderstanding and Please Don't Ask, were accepted. Phil was always slightly frustrated because Tony and Mike were such prolific songwriters in Genesis. But Duke was the first opportunity for him to contribute his own songs. He was always into Motown, and I felt that's where his heart really was. Having not worked together for nearly a year, the band felt invigorated and inspired by their reacquaintance, and excellent new material came into being quite quickly. This included a 30 minute long suite under the working title Duke. However, the band decided to break the suite up and spread the songs over the entire album. One transitional section was called Turn It On again and extended into a full song. With its driving rocky rhythm in a 13-8 time signature, the song became the first hit of the forthcoming album, as well as a fan favorite. In November 1979, Genesis and producer David Henschel went to Polar Studios in Stockholm, where Banks and Rutherford's solo albums had been recorded earlier in the year. A new album, Duke, was released in March of 1980 and was a huge success commercially, reaching number one in the UK album charts and number 11 in the US. Duke was critically well received. Many reviewers noticed the tighter melodies and song structures, Collins' confident singing and the rockier, more aggressive arrangements that featured the guitars closer to the forefront. The third single, Misunderstanding, is another highlight while Duchess features the Roland CR78 drum machine that Collins had used when demoing his own songs. Genesis promoted Duke with a 40-day tour, which finished in June of 1980, and went on hiatus again afterwards. However, rather than go their separate ways, the band members focused on finding a place in which they could build their own recording studio. In November, they bought Fisher Lane Farm, located one hour southwest of London. Over the next four months, sections of the property were converted into a rehearsal room and recording studio. The band's new recording facility was called The Farm and located in a former cow shed. The small, rather dark control room was designed in a 70s style by architect John Flynn, with the help from Andy Munro on the acoustics. The initial equipment consisted of an AMEC, 3624M2000A desk, Studer A80 24 track and two track recorders, an EMT echo plate, URI monitors powered by Crown amps, and microphones by Shaw, Bayer, Neumann, and PZM. 
In an interview, Tony Banks explained, we'd always dreamt of having our own studio because we didn't want to have that time pressure during the actual recording process. We also didn't want to separate writing, rehearsal, and recording anymore, and to be able to write and record at the same time. We'd also become tired of traveling up to London whilst recording, so we decided to build a studio close to our homes. Genesis started work on the follow-up to Duke early in 1981. While construction work on the cow shed was still going on, they wrote new material in the main farmhouse, mostly through collective improvisation and often using a Roland TR-808 drum machine so Collins could focus on singing. The band moved into the finished recording studio in March of 1981. There was also a change of personnel, as the band and Henschel had, by mutual agreement, decided they had exhausted their collaboration. The producer had first worked with the band as an engineer on Nursery Crime back in 1971. Phil Collins' debut solo album Face Value and its lead single In the Air Tonight were riding high in the charts in the beginning of 1981. The album had been engineered and co-produced by Hugh Padgham after Collins had been impressed with the engineer producer's work on Peter Gabriel's third album. Both albums featured the famous gated room sound that Pageant had stumbled on accidentally while using the talkback mic on an SSL 4000 desk. At Collins' suggestion, Genesis decided to work with Pageant at the band's The Farm Studio. The result was a further tightening of their songs, sound, and production approach. In an interview in 2015, Tony Banks remarked that the new album, Abacab, marked a very conscious decision to try and break some of Genesis' traditions, get rid of the reprises, the extended solos, the big choruses, and tambourines, and everything. As a result, the band ended up tossing an hour of music that they felt contained too many trappings of old. The band was also influenced by the more minimalistic new wave music that was in vogue at the time, resulting in banks using harder synth sounds, with keyboards like the Yamaha CS80, ARP Quadra, Prophet 10, Yamaha DX7, and the Yamaha CP70 Electric Grand Piano. It started to get rid of many older keyboards like the Hammond organ and the Mellotron. Rutherford and Banks played few solos and tended more towards being part of the general arrangements, which were more rhythmic and focused than in the past. Genesis also used guest musicians for the first time since a string section on the band's debut album, in the shape of the Phoenix Horns on No Reply At All. Do tell me, is there something that I should know? The Phoenix Horns are part of the funk soul band Earth, Wind and Fire. They had also appeared on Collins' Face Value album, and the fact that Genesis used them illustrates the increasingly strong influence of Collins and his fondness of soul music. Abacab was released in September of 1981 and continued the upward direction of the previous albums in terms of commercial success, going to number one in the UK and France, and number seven in the US. It was mostly well received critically, with many noticing the influence of face value. All music called Abacab truly modern art rock, their last album that could bear that tag comfortably. Genesis toured Abacab until the end of 1981, again with Chester Thompson on drums and Daryl Sturmer on guitar. In May of 1982, an EP of outtakes from the album was released, called 3 by 3 It contained the song Paper Late, which again featured the Phoenix Horns and became a hit in several countries, reaching number 10 in the UK. Genesis continued touring until the end of the summer of 1982, and on the 2nd of October performed a one-off concert with Peter Gabriel at the Milton Keynes Bowl. The purpose was to help out the band's former singer, who was deep in debt after losing a lot of money on the first WOMAD festival he had organized. Steve Hackett joined him for the last two songs. Following this, Genesis took a break for a few months, which allowed Collins to write and record his second solo album, Hello, I Must Be Going, which became a big hit worldwide. This was in part due to the enormous success of the lead single, You Can't Hurry Love, a cover of the 1966 hit for The Supremes. Genesis reconvened at the farm in March of 1983, with Hugh Padgham again engineering and promoted to the co-producer of the new album with the band. For the first time, the band was able to write and record as part of the same process, fulfilling the purpose for which they had built the farm. All music was written collectively and the lyrics of each song by an individual. The new material was also further enhanced by the latest technology, in particular a Lin LM1 drum machine, an NED Synclavia digital synth and sampler, and an EMU emulator sampler. 
The result was an inspired collection of songs, several of which have gone on to become classics. The forthcoming album's lead single and opening track, Mama, was released in August of 1982 and became the band's most commercially successful song. This was remarkable as the song is unusual in many respects. It starts with three minutes of the Lin LM1 drum machine as the most dominant instrument before the sound of the full band finally come in. <laughs> Rutherford had programmed the Lin drum machine and it was fed through an AMS RMX 16 reverb with a gated reverb setting and then a guitar amp. Rutherford also played a Gibson SG guitar, Collins was on Simmons drums, and Banks played a Prophet 10, Synclavia, a Yamaha CP70 piano, and an ARP Quadra, and an Emu emulator, in which he had sampled a Koto. A cruel sounding laugh by Collins was also used repeatedly as a sample inspired by the song The Message by the American rapper Grandmaster Flash. Mama contains several innovations that became part of the Genesis sound. Banks used a hi-hat from the Lin drum machine as a trigger to drive the arpeggiator on his arp quadra, which was a way of synchronizing the two instruments before MIDI made this easy. And Collins had developed an unusual technique to make his voice extremely harsh and cutting. While Collins took over as the lead singer from Peter Gabriel at the end of 1975, there had been some concern among his band members whether he'd be able to achieve the edgier, cutting vocal sound that was Peter Gabriel's trademark. Collins had a softer, gentler voice, but after assuming the role of lead singer, he clearly grew into his role, singing with increasing confidence and power. When Collins worked with Hugh Padgham on his first solo album, he discovered a way of making his vocal sound even more aggressive and cutting, which he used to great effect on Mama and many other Genesis tracks. Collins' aggressive vocal sound was in part the result of combining a biodynamic M88 TG dynamic microphone with a very cheap Allen & Heath limiter. Tony Banks recalled, I think it was the first type they ever made. It came with the Brennell 8-track tape recorders we once used. The limiter was incredibly unsubtle and it gave an extraordinary effect on Phil's voice. Nowadays, limiters try to give you this lovely soft attack, but the A&H cuts in absolutely square. So you get this kind of effect, which was used to great effect on tracks like Mama. It became a trademark sound of ours. Hugh Pageon gave more details on how Collins' vocal sound was achieved. Nine times out of ten, when you're recording someone's vocal, you have a limiter or compressor to keep the dynamics within a certain range. In those days, when you were using tape, this was even more important. Phil discovered while doing demos that if he sang in a very guttural way, the Allen & Heath Mini Limiter would really grab a hold of it. Limiter had one slide kind of knob that let you get either more compression or less compression and gave very basic options of fast attack, slow attack, fast release, and slow release. Phil realized that if he had a limiter on a very slow attack but fast release, if he sang a word that began with a sharp consonant like a K or a T, the initial front of the K would get through the limiter before it started limiting. So we had this very pronounced front to a word that was kind of a consonant. He used the limiter almost as an instrument. It's a very distinct sound. Genesis' self-titled 12th studio album was released six weeks after Mama in October of 1983 and quickly went to number one on the UK charts and number nine in the US charts. It remained in both charts for almost a year. The album received mostly positive reviews and yielded two Grammy Award nominations. The second single from the album, That's All, was released four weeks later. Despite its subject matter also being quite dark, the song sounds ultra catchy and optimistic and is therefore almost the polar opposite of Mama. That's all came out of Banks sampling a guitar pipe by Rutherford in his emulator and slowing it down to half time. He played the part on his Yamaha CP70 electric grand piano and developed it into the main riff. Other keyboards Banks used on the track are a Prophet 10 and the Synclavia for the B3 organ sound, affected by an MXR Phase 100 pedal. The third track and third single from the album is Home by the Sea. Collins remembers, we'd record with a program drum machine, Tony would play a guide keyboard part, Mike would play a guide guitar part, and I'd sing a guide vocal. These guide parts enabled us to settle on the format for the songs. If we liked what we got, each of us would then go in and record our parts again. I'd replace the Lin drums with my drums, and after all of it, I'd go in and re-record my vocal. 
Home by the Sea segues into the largely instrumental second Home by the Sea, which had the working title Heavy Simmons because of, well, Colin's use of the Simmons drums. Tony Banks explained, we got two or three hours worth of jamming on tape. A lot of it sounded quite good, but we couldn't tie it down. So we listened to it, selected good moments of the jam, and then Mike and I relearned exactly what we played. I think it produced a great result. It's one of my favorites. Genesis often referred to its self-titled album as Mama and promoted it with the Mama Tour, which ran until February of 1984, after which the band went on hiatus for one and a half years. During this time, all band members worked on solo projects, in the case of Banks writing the soundtrack album for the film Starship, while Mike Rutherford formed Mike and the Mechanics. This project proved unexpectedly successful, as the band's self-titled debut album, released in October of 1985, was supported by two major hits, Silent Running, sung by Paul Carrick, and All I Need is a Miracle, sung by Paul Young. However, the efforts by both Genesis members were overshadowed by the success of Colin's second solo album, No Jacket Required, which went to number one in dozens of countries, a feat Genesis never achieved. Colin's solo career was by now overshadowing Genesis, and there were questions about his commitment to the band. However, he and the others turned up at the farm in October of 85 for the writing and recording of Invisible Touch, with Hugh Padgham again engineering and co-producing with the band. Genesis had used the hiatus to completely revamp the farm studio, because they wanted a large control room with natural daylight and two live areas, one a stone room of Colin's drums. The studio gear had been upgraded to a 56-channel SSL 4000E with total recall and an SSL integral synchronizer controlling two Studer A800 multitracks, plus a Sony U-Matic machine which allowed the group to do post-production work on their videos. Sam Toyoshima from Tokyo did the acoustic design, and the band had to produce him into installing a large window. Tony Banks explained in an interview at the time, Windows were of prime importance to us, one of the things we really wanted to have in our own studio. We'd always reckoned that the acoustic arguments for not having them were rather dubious. The Stone Live Room and the SSL came very much from our, and particularly Phil's, experience of the townhouse. We felt that that was a good place to take as a starting point. In addition to the new studio gear, Collins' electronic gear had expanded from the Roland CR78, Lindrum, Simmons SDS8, to also include the Roland TR-808, TR-909, TR-727, and Pad-8 Octopad, as well as the Oberheim DMX. Banks had MIDI fitted to his Yamaha CP70 electric piano and had added a Yamaha DX7 synth and QX1 sequencer to his arsenal, as well as a Roland Super Jupiter. At this point, Rutherford had been using the Roland G202 and G505 synth guitars for a number of years, but he played most of his parts on Invisible Touch and the associated tour with Steinberger guitars and basses, including a Steinberger GM1T that was designed by Roger Griffin and adapted by Steinberger. In addition, Rutherford had well over 50 guitars and basses at the time, so it's hard to nail down exactly what instruments he used and when. Genesis worked at the farm from October 1985 to February 1986 on writing and recording new material, with the same collective improvisational approach as their previous albums, working to a rhythm from a drum machine. Collins remembered about writing the title track. One day, Mike Rutherford played a riff on guitar with an echo, and suddenly I sang, She seems to have an invisible touch. Yeah. It came into my head fully formed. Our writing process was close to jazz. We improvise. We weren't afraid to make lousy noises. Rutherford added, The best songs tend to be written quickly. That's how it was with Invisible Touch. We'd rock up, have a cup of tea, see what happened. On day one, we had no songs, no ideas, and a blank bit of paper. Phil was always keen to fill that bit of paper. He was very organized, and we let him. It's a wonderful song. Upbeat, fun to play, always a strong moment in any gig. The title song for the new album was released in May of 1986 and became another big hit. It was the only song by the band to be an American number one. The album was released in June and shot to number one in the UK and number three in the US. The next four singles from the album, Throwing It All Away, Land of Confusion, In Too Deep, and Tonight, 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 all entered the American top five. 
Genesis was the first non-American act to achieve this. Despite the overwhelming commercial success, reviews were mixed, with some critics writing that it sounded like a Phil Collins solo album, and many commenting on the slightly cold and sterile production, courtesy of the enormous amount of electronic instruments used, including Collins Simmons drums. In retrospect, the album does have the most distinct 80s sound of all the Genesis albums from the era. However, the album earned Genesis a Grammy nomination for the song The Brazilian in the Best Pop Instrumental category, and its first Grammy award for the video for the protest song Land of Confusion. The tour to promote Invisible Touch consisted of 112 dates from September 1986 to July 1987. The last four dates were at Wembley Stadium in London, attended by a total of almost 300,000 fans. Tony Banks called it the peak of our career. The Wembley shows were immortalized in the world's first ever high definition music video, the Invisible Touch Tour in 1988, later reissued as Genesis Live at Wembley Stadium. After the tour, the band members went their separate ways for three and a half years. It allowed each of them to focus on their solo careers. In the case of Collins, this involved another worldwide number one solo album, but seriously, featuring the monster hit Another Day in Paradise. Mike Rutherford worked on two more Mike and the Mechanics albums. Living Years contained the mega hit The Living Years, while word of mouth was slightly less successful. Tony Banks released a third solo album, Still, the three members of Genesis got back together at the farm in March of 1991, where they worked for half a year on the band's 14th album, We Can't Dance. This time, Nick Davies was engineering and co-producing. He'd worked with Rutherford and Banks on their solo projects. The equipment at the farm had been upgraded for the digital age, with a Sony 3348-48 track and 3324-24 track digital tape recorders. At the time, the 3348 was regarded as the Rolls-Royce of digital recording. The monitors included Acoustic Research AR-18s, Proac and Westlakes, with monitor amps by Amcron. In addition to the output gear by AMS, Lexicon, Neve, and Focusrite, the studio also had two Sony 1630 DMR-2000 mastering machines, plus a Sony DMR-4000 digital mastering recorder and a DAE-3000 digital audio editor. Banks' enormous keyboard collection had been augmented by Rhodes MNK80, a Kurzweil DX1000, and a Roland JD800. Rutherford put his synth guitars aside and played mostly a Fender Stratocaster and two Steinberger guitars, as well as a Rickenbacker 12 string. In addition to his pedals, he used rack mounted effects like the Yamaha SPX90 and Lexicon PCM41. The main farmhouse now also had a writing suite called Scrapyard Studio with an Emu Emulator 3, Yamaha DX7, Lindrum, Atari Mega ST2 computer, Emu Emulator 2, Emu SP12 drum machine, Fostex B16 tape recorder, and a SEC 1882 desk. The songs on the new album, once again, came into being through the tried and tested collective improvisation method. The album's lead single, No Son of Mine, was released in October of 1991 featured an attention-grabbing elephant-like sound that was a result of Banks' sampling a guitar sound from Rutherford and lowering it dramatically in pitch. The song quickly became a worldwide hit. You know, son, you know, son we Can't Dance was released a week after the lead single and became Genesis' fifth successive number one in the UK. It remains the band's best-selling album in its home country, with one and a half million sales. The production of the album was warmer and less electronic than for Invisible Touch, and reviews were more positive. There was another Grammy nomination for the second single, I Can't Dance. A customary tour to promote the album followed its release and ended in November of 1992. Two live albums were released with recordings from the tour, The Way We Walk, Volume 1, The Shorts, which reached number 3 in the UK, and The Way We Walk, Volume 2, The Longs, which was another UK number 1. After the We Can't Dance tour, Genesis went on hiatus again, and in March 1996, Collins made the long-expected announcement to the press that he was leaving Genesis, as he wanted to focus entirely on his solo career. Banks and Rutherford 
decided to continue as Genesis and auditioned a string of singers. They eventually settled on Ray Wilson of the Scottish band Stiltskin. The recordings for the final Genesis studio album, Calling All Stations, took place at the farm over the first half of 1997, using the at the time popular radar recording system. Almost all material was written by Banks and Rutherford. The drums were played by guest musicians Nick De Virgilio and Nia Zidkiahu. Calling All Stations was released in September of 1997. Although it reached number two in the UK and France, it sold far less than the previous albums. The three singles, Congo, Shipwrecked, and Not About Us, failed to make much impact. A 47-date European tour had to go without regular live musicians Sturmer and Chester Thompson, as they were committed to work with Collins. They were replaced by Zidkiahu on drums and Anthony Drennan on guitar and bass. An American tour was arranged twice and in both cases cancelled because of lack of ticket sales. Genesis had in effect ceased to exist after the final date of the European tour on May the 31st, 1998. However, Collins, Rutherford and Banks have since been in action again as Genesis for two more tours. In 2007, there was the Turn It On Again tour with long-term live band members Daryl Sturmer and Chester Thompson. And very recently, in 2021 and 22, the trio undertook the Last Domino Tour. The latter saw Collins, because of ill health, unable to play the drums and singing while sitting down. Sturmer returned on guitar and bass, and the drum stall was occupied by Collins' son, Nick. Despite Genesis' last studio album dating from 1997, the legacy of the band has not only been kept alive by the two aforementioned tours, but also by a series of eight box sets with official recordings remixed by Nick Davis in stereo and surround, and live recordings, demos, and studio outtakes, plus several concert video releases, and a live recording of the 2007 tour Live Over Europe. With up to 150 million albums sold and household name status, pretty much all over the world, the band's commercial legacy is unassailable. The same can be said for its musical legacy. As we saw in the previous video, the band's prog rock years were foundational to the prog rock genre and have influenced countless artists. The influence of the post-1977 music of Genesis is more difficult to define, but it had a major influence on 80s music in general and on many famous bands from the era, like Simple Minds, Echo and the Bunnymen, The Human League, and so on. Phil Collins' influence as a drummer and a vocalist has also been considerable. In 2010, Genesis were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame by Trey Anastasio of Fish. The spirit of this band. Rebellious, restless, and constantly striving for something more than the obvious. Every musical rule and boundary was questioned and broken. It's impossible to overstate what a huge impact this band and this musical philosophy had on me and it needs to be added on the entire world of music. Just like everybody else, I'm a huge fan of all of the early stuff, all of the Peter Gabriel stuff. The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, Nursery Crime. I mean, these are some of the greatest albums ever recorded. In fact, on a flight that I took just last night, I listened to most of their albums up until the early 80s. Huge fan. But when they started writing I suppose what you might call pop songs. They did it in a way that only people from that band could do, just the way that Peter Gabriel can do. When you listen to Turn It On Again and you hear a song that's predominantly in 13-8, that was a massive worldwide smash. I mean, God bless them. It would, wouldn't we all love it if we had hits like that on the radio? So Modern Genesis to me is still absolutely amazing. And I'll, I'll Mama is a masterpiece. The album it came from is a masterpiece. And the fact that it can have a song like Mama, and then that's all on the same record. Absolutely incredible. We could all be so lucky to be that musical and be able to write, you know, 13 minute masterpieces in odd timing and still be able to write massive pop songs. And it is a tribute to every single member of that band. Steve Hackett solo is incredible. Phil Collins' solo is incredible. All of the members, Peter Gabriel's solo, unassailable. Absolutely amazing. Mike Rutherford's material is incredible. Tony Banks is one of the greatest keyboard players that ever lived, and his solo music is insane. All of them, obviously, are some of the greatest musicians ever. The fact that they went from, you know, so many different members leaving down to a three-piece and then kept growing is 
ridiculous. So if you didn't watch the first video in the series, please go and check it out. Thank you ever so much for watching. Thanks Genesis for creating such incredible music. So long, farewell, avi au revoir, adios, goodbye.